is called Blindsided by the Taliban. It is the story of a war correspondent in Afghanistan, uh, and he is here with us. Carmen Gentile is his name, and uh, we are ready to talk to us. You, you're, you're originally from New Kensington, right? That I am. Uh, so, I grew up in New Kent area and uh, went to school in Fox Chapel at Shadyside. I graduated, and then that's when I left uh, Pittsburgh when I was 18. But I always, uh, you know, Pittsburgh's always in my heart. Where did you get this adrenaline junkie thing from where you've got to be where the action is? Uh, I think I was born with it. I always had a little bit of a, a penchant for wanting to push the envelope, even as a kid, which uh, resulted like when you in, broke your wrist? When it resulted in <laughs> numerous injuries that were always uh, upsetting my folks, um, having them worry about what I was up to next. Yeah, I had stitches and broken bones and contusions uh, aplenty as a, as a kid. You know, you don't look too bad uh, for a guy who was <laughs> shot by an RPG. I, I have never known anyone to survive after being shot by an RPG. Well... Yeah, I, I call it the trillion to one shot, and uh, the fact that, that it didn't go off is uh, uh, still uh, a head scratcher for me and for many people. But and the blow was uh, was uh, really destructive to you. That it was. It blinded me immediately in this in my right eye and uh, crushed all these bones in the side of my face, requiring major reconstructive surgery and uh, surgery to repair and and save my eye. I don't have full vision in it. Uh, I have a lens that's permanently stitched to my eye that, that refocuses a bit. It's uh, blurry and a little bit of a wave in what I see, but good enough to still ride my motorcycle. And so you're doing this monocular vision and, and doing fairly well. You've yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. I uh, still have trouble parallel parking, <clears throat> but I it actually hasn't uh, made it uh, too difficult for me otherwise. Uh, I ride a motorcycle, so I actually have more room to navigate on the road, and so it's it's not that quite as difficult. You got your depth perception? Yeah, it's pretty good. I have I have a, a problem at about this distance, mm -hmm. so whenever I go in for handshakes, I have to really concentrate or get my key in the door. Um, and uh, when I'm working at home, when I'm writing or reading, I always uh, wear an eye patch because uh, in addition to this eye being blurry and, and, and whatnot, I have uh, my pupil is fixed dilated, so everything's very bright out of this eye. So right now, these, these overhead lights, lights are uh, glaring in this eye and okay in this one. But, and and you know, outside, okay. you have to wear your sunglasses. I always wear sunglasses time. outside, and mm -hmm. then I have the tinted... Uh, glasses that I well, wear we had indoors. had a photograph of you rocking the patch, and I know after the injury, <laughs> you considered how cool it would be to, I thought to it rock would be the cool. patch. Yeah, I thought it would. It didn't quite work no, out like that. No, you know, I, I, I had this, this idea that it, that it would be, uh, that it would be a, a cool little uh, addition to my, to my look, but I, I, I never wanted to really wear it in public because then you're that guy who wears an eye patch, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm a little too self-conscious about it to wear it all the time. All right, let's talk about fighting the war in Afghanistan. Uh, you embedded uh, the first time you went uh, at a, a small, forgive my terminology, fire base. That's from my era in right, Vietnam. Right, right. We call okay. them combat outposts. Yeah, combat yeah. outposts. So we, we call them fire bases. Sure. They, they weren't much outgoing fire. There was more incoming. Right. And you're the second guy I've interviewed who describes uh, these bases in a valley where everybody can look down on you and go woohoo bang yeah, right. uh, and and I wonder what the military brass is thinking when they put you down in this valley or troops down in this valley you sure. were embedded with them and you all have to hike up through all this uh, rubble and mountainous uh, terrain and you are the object of being surrounded on all sides by guys who have the high ground and you're the second guy I've interviewed who was based at a, a, a place like that it right. doesn't make sense militarily to me I am not uh, an expert in military strategy. But you've talked to the brass. You've been a great I have talked to the brass. I have talked to these people. And I am just as confused about it as you are. <laughs> I have no idea why they did that. And I know for a fact that uh, there are subsequent leaders of the U.S. Uh, mission there in Afghanistan who have said this doesn't make sense. Um, why they did it to begin with? I'm sure that they had uh, reams of reports saying that this is a good idea, but if you look at it in operation, it makes absolutely no sense. And to the guys who were in those positions, it makes really makes no sense. 
So t tell me what it's like uh, to be embedded and, and watch these guys as they fight the war. Tell us about that first time you were at, uh, uh, what's the base called, PK? Uh, Pertle K. P Pertle K, uh, where you take this long march up the hill your first time out. And what's that like? Well, the first time I went out with these guys, uh, we left for a mission that would just take us into this, and we were scheduled to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning. And at 3 a.m., there we are walking out the gate and uh, making a left and then heading up this um, steep hill of loose rocks uh, into the mountains, uh, slipping and sliding, ankles twisting. Uh, you know, you're walking at elevation with all this gear on, sweating profusely. You carried a lot of water, and it still wasn't enough. <laughs> was and these guys, yeah. these guys had a lot more gear. These than guys you had did. twice as much gear mm -hmm. uh, than, I, than as I did. Um, most of them were about 15 years younger, so they had that going for them. And they were, well, I don't know if they were smokers or not, but you, you. Were I was a smoking cigarettes at the time. Mm -hmm. I've since quit, and a lot of the, Again? a lot of, a lot, yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of the, a lot of the soldiers, uh, they smoke cigarettes as well because. Well, let's face it. Young, that's the least of your yeah. problems. Cancer is mm -hmm. the least of your problems when when you're in a day to day um, potential fight with with uh, boogeymen in the mountains. So yeah. In, in fact, it's a non addicting uh, relief. You talk about sometimes. Well, there is that. Um, uh, yeah, there's that 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 uh, moment of, of uh, reprieve from just having to maybe concentrate on, on or think about what's happening there all all the time and uh you know a lot of guys do smoke so you're all smoking together and it's this this it's a it's a camaraderie thing so you I go guess. on this hike you climb all the way up the mountain mm -hmm. you've come all the way down uh mm -hmm. past dark you want to be in by dark but, right but is that any way to fight a war what is being accomplished in that because you always uh, uh were concerned about the, the lower ranking fighting man's position mm -hmm. and what did you say never talked to anybody under major or? well i i always i never really wanted to talk to anybody uh uh higher than a captain mm -hmm. and uh occasionally I'd, ha I'd have to because that's what my editors wanted and those those names ring out like you mentioned general and others um, but I'm more concerned about what the guys on the ground are doing um, and what, how they feel about what they're in their experience, right? So uh, as they perceive it, and as I would, as I perceived it, you know, they're doing their jobs, they're taking orders, but they they know it doesn't make any sense either. They have this what they would call presence patrols, just to show the enemy that you're not afraid to be where you are, and um, if in fact they were to take a shot at you, you would, what they call, move to contact, which means, okay, if the shooting's coming from over there, we're gonna move toward that area and try to, try to get those guys. Uh, but again, like you mentioned, they always have the high ground, and in, and in the high ground, this area uh, where the Taliban has control, uh, there are caves, there are boulders, there are all kinds of places where you can hide, uh, you can squeeze off a few shots, duck behind a rock. It's very hard to, to locate these guys. You'll see muzzle flashes and puffs of smoke, but you rarely see the enemy. Um, I've only seen the enemy a handful of times, and one of the times was the guy who shot me. Um, so it's, it's hard to, uh, to, to fight that kind of war, for sure. I, I just wonder uh, if America ever learns. In, in Vietnam, uh, we used to say the same thing. Uh, come out and fight, we'll whoop you behind. Uh, yeah. But they never did that. They only attacked when they had the advantage in an ambush uh, and in very similar circumstances. And I don't know if America ever learns from this kind of contact. You can't go into another man's home and kick in his doors and fight him uh, without him taking the high ground and, and, and just pecking away at you no full frontal assault just pecking away at you yeah why would they what's the point of saying okay uh, yeah sure we'll 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 meet you on an equal playing field in a uh, battleground uh, when you have every implement known to right. mankind uh, for warfare right what's a it's called asymmetrical warfare mm -hmm. why would you fight that way it's not unlike uh, the problem that the the British faced in in America when they came here, we were fighting a uh, the the uh, revolutionaries were fighting a guerrilla style mm -hmm. war, and they would march in a line, and one line would kneel in front of the other, and they would fire and then reload, and that's the way that they were used to fighting, fire and then reload, and that's the way that they were used to fighting, but, uh, because you use the the advantage you use your your advantages. 
um, being the terrain and you're on your your home field why, why would you why would you want to fight the way that your enemy wants you to fight and well when you're always outnumbered and always outgunned you fight sure, guerrilla you style, fight, right? you, you fight the guerrilla warfare i mm -hmm. mean and i feel as though like you mentioned, the U.S. didn't learn that lesson from Afghanistan, excuse me, from Vietnam, and they certainly um, didn't apply any lessons they may have learned there in Afghanistan, in my estimation. Um, so uh, tell me about the day that you were on this patrol and you uh, walked near uh, a village and you were talking to some young men mm -hmm. uh, and then um, something happened. You describe what happened. Okay, we were... Uh, walking into this small village near the Afghan-Pakistani border, just a few miles away from, from Pakistan. And it's a tiny village called Gui, just a handful of brick and mortar uh, and stone huts, a uh, tiny uh, dirt road. And uh, it was near sunset on the last day of Ramadan. This is the time when um, the people of the Muslim faith are preparing for their big end of Ramadan celebration and called Eid. And you felt you might be offending them, yeah, as a matter of fact, Yeah, we definitely were. Right? Mm -hmm. We definitely were. I got it immediately as we were walking in there, I got that, I got that hinky vibe. And uh, you can tell whether or not a situation is okay when you walk into a village by the children. And if there are children around and they're waving to you and if they're playing, everything's going to be okay. But when the children are scattered or are gone, that's when you know something's wrong. And guys from Vietnam say the exact same thing. And that's the, the experience of Afghanistan as well. So there were no children. And it was, it was eerily quiet. Nobody really wanted to talk. Just these young guys on the side of the road. I had my video camera with me. I trained it on these guys. I was asking them questions, and I just knew something w was wrong. And I was, if you listen to, the, to, to my voice on the video, you could just, I'm nervous. Uh, and I, I didn't hide it very well. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear this whooshing sound from behind me. And I turn, and uh, just down the road, maybe 30, 40 yards away, was a guy with an RPG. And he had a, well, I could see him shouldering it. And out of the end of it was the, was the ordinance. It was coming right at me. And in that moment, um, I thought, this is it. I'm done. This will, be, this will be my last moment. And it hit me in the side of the head, and the, and the ordinance didn't go off, but it blinded me in this eye, and I thought for a second, well, this, this is death. And... Uh, then I heard this loud ringing in my ears, and I dropped to one knee, and that's when the blood started coming out. And uh, I could see out of my left eye, and after the ringing subsided a little bit, I could hear somebody say, are you okay? And I said, no. And I just kept saying, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, and then that's when the uh, soldiers pulled me to the side of the road, immediately started treating me, putting a bandage on my head, and uh, they called in what are called pararescue jumpers. Those are the guys that, that fly into these hot zones to pick up that have been injured. And they, they came and got me and took me to the large military base, Bagram. That's where I had my first surgery. All right, Carmen Gentile is our guest. He is a war correspondent who's been to Afghanistan a number of times. He just recently got back from Iraq. Uh, we're talking about his memoir, Blindsided by the Taliban, where he was actually shot in the face by a rocket-propelled grenade. Only man I know to survive such an attack. We'll continue talking to him about his wartime experiences in just a second. You can join us at any time by dialing 412-333-PCNC. Blindsided by the Taliban, and our guest is the author, Carmen Gentile, who's originally from uh, the Pittsburgh area, New Ken to be exact. Um, right. Well, after you were wounded, um, and I've interviewed and talked to a number of people uh, who have been wounded uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq, 
and they tell me the care is excellent and the care you got was pretty excellent because you're pretty descriptive in what happened to your eye and the jelly that gives the eye the shape falling mm -hmm. out and the, the doctor in Bagram who did such an excellent job treating you and then on to lunch stool. Um, the, tell us about that and the treatment you get because it's emblematic of the treatment that our soldiers and Marines get when they're wounded too. Well, you know, the uh, I w when I was brought to Bagram, they uh, immediately there was an Air Force ophthalmologist who uh, operated on my eye. And when I woke up, they told me you're probably going to lose that eye. But that's when I, I later learned that uh, not know, to th say the worst. They say the worst mm. so that that you know when when things go their way, that's that's you know mm. diminishing expectations. Mm. And so, um, but. Uh, they were able to save it, and uh, I later had a, a three more operations in uh, New York at Columbia Presbyterian, which has one of the best ophthalmology units in the world. And the doctors there told me that the work that that doctor did in, in Afghanistan was excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the irony is that there have been a number of major medical uh, uh, advances over the last 17 years because of the work that has been done on soldiers and civilians injured in Afghanistan and Iraq. They've been able to do um, things that they probably hadn't even conceived because they had been confronted with these types of injuries. In my case, the doctors in New York told me that 10 years ago I would have lost my eye. However, there had been so many advances in the treatment of eye injuries that were first done in the war zones that allowed them to be able to save it. So the irony being that <laughs> the war, the fact that the war had been, been going on for so long was why I was able to keep my eye. So you get to Landstuhl and within a matter of days you're treated and you're back here. In Landstuhl I didn't have another surgery, mm -hmm. but they were just there. I was there for observation. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw another doctor there, another ophthalmologist. They were just making sure that everything else was okay. They had. Um, you know, they, they kept me well sedated because I had all these fractures in my face. And, and what are you wondering? Painful. What's going through your mind at all this? All this? Oh, you know, I had um, a number of concerns about, you know, the fact that I was going to probably be blind in one eye, that I uh, had first, uh, it was there in Longstall that I first looked under the bandage at what had happened to my face, and I was disfigured. Uh, I, was, I was in a bad way. And uh, that weighed heavily on me. Um, I uh, had some personal issues with uh, uh, somebody to whom I'd actually been engaged at the time, and there were there was a, an issue there that I was weighing heavily on me. I don't want to get into too many details because I want people to read my book. But there was, that's part of the story. Um, it wasn't just the, the, the physical pain and loss. There was uh, definitely a, a strong emotional component. But see, I, I, I won't ask you to delve into that too deeply, but that's what happens to a lot of uh, uh, soldiers and Marines also uh, who are injured. Uh, then there are personal issues at home, uh, if the love life is not going well for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and that puts an emotional burden on you as well as the physical burden that you're dealing with. Absolutely. I went through a really hard time in uh, the, from the time of my injury and all through my recovery, months and months of recovery, I had uh, a number of I would say, you know, personal existential crises regarding my future, my present, what I'd done in the past, and just everything. When you have all this time that you're spending recovering and I'm not doing the work that I love and my future is uncertain, uh, you know, it, it got pretty dark there for a while. As a freelance journalist, one of the organizations you were working for was CBS News. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd have to say to you, thank God for CBS because they took care of you once you got back. And it raises the whole question to me of health care in this nation. Not everybody has the kind of care you got, back, you got when you got back here because somebody was footing the bill to make sure that you got the best. Absolutely. I, uh, when I got hurt, the uh, folks at CBS uh, circled the wagons and thought, okay, how are we going to handle this? In fact, their chief medical correspondent 
was responsible Dr. for... Dr. Jean Lepou? Yes, mm -hmm. was responsible for uh, getting the, the doctors on board at uh, Columbia Presbyterian, telling them this is what happened, this is what uh, you know, we need to, to do. Uh, how do we how do we get this guy where he needs to be? How do we fix this guy? How do we make him whole again? And there was a, a team of doctors that worked on me um, that I mentioned in the book, and uh, a host of other folks that were that played a role. And everyone seemed to be genuinely interested in what happened to me. I had the the chief of medicine at the hospital come visit me, mostly out of curiosity, but you know he wanted to see how I was doing. But he wanted to hear the story and what had happened and. There are a lot of a lot of people that that were working together uh, to to help put all the pieces back together. So you know, my mother had uh, brain surgery at one time. You talk about what they were going to do, what they didn't, but they actually cut her uh, in her scalp, shaved right. her hairline, and peeled her face down. They right. they were talking about doing that to you, correct? But they didn't do it. But but describe what happened. They they put steel plates in your head. Right. They had to work on your eye. Put that jelly back in your right. eye. Um, to give it its shape, um, a lens, right? Numerous they, surgeries. Right. I've had a total of four surgeries, and what they what they did was I have this existing uh, scar here from when the ordinance hit me. This is the actual place where the the tip of the rocket hit me, and the rest of this scar is where they made the incision uh, and went in to to fix my eye this uh, the orbital socket which is crushed from here all the way up to here so I have metal I have 12 plates and four pins that run through this side of my face that I can still feel right now you can see I have a little bump right there that's one of them uh, particularly and that's your little tick now you, you yeah you I have this tendency where I'll, where, I'll, where I'll touch it and even though know, I know it hurts. I, I, I will tell you if if I did not uh, know all that had happened to you at first glance I would never know no you wouldn't uh, you'd if you look closely then you could see one of my eyes is is fixed dilated this pupil is mm -hmm. bigger than this one uh, yeah, I have this scar and a little bit of a. But nobody which, looks that close. Nobody looks. That, <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Um, so, so you can't. They tell. gave you this kind of care. They put you up in an apartment. Gave you right. a home care health right. worker. Right. Uh, and and still, you couldn't sit still. You had to roam around New York and go buy clothes. <laughs> yeah. Adrenaline jockey personified. Right well, here. there was. I had this this period uh, during my recovery where I was under strict orders to keep my head down at all times because the the lens was affixing to my eye and they had to make sure that it stayed in place. And that's when the swelling occurred. And that's when the swelling occurred. But I had to. To 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 keep my head down and I was supposed to rest and but I was going stir crazy in this apartment I was there all the time by myself um, friends would come over to visit me and uh, you know take me out for the occasional walk like I was a cocker spaniel stuck in the house but I, at one I was point amazed that they didn't get a place with an elevator to yeah. tell you the <laughs> well they wanted me near the hospital so mm -hmm. this is a part of New York Washington Heights which is uh, um, just a lot of walk ups and. Uh, so I, I, I just couldn't sit still, and at one point I just decided to throw, throw on some shoes and, and, and take in the city, even though I had to keep my head down the whole time, um, and head into town and buy some clothes. Because and that's I didn't dangerous. Have I mean, you almost got hit by a limo, <laughs> yeah. uh, bicycle messages going the way, and you yeah. have to look down, mm -hmm. uh, and you've only got monocular vision in one eye. Right. You're a bold rascal to go navigating through the streets in New York. Uh, some say, might say that, some say I might have rocks in my head. Maybe it's a little bit of both. <laughs> you think that's all it is? Uh, I have that, uh, I have that itch. I, I, and I, like I said before, I've had it ever since I was a kid. And I've had it ever since I was a kid. And, uh, in a positive way, I try to, to do things. Uh, I try to, uh, if I'm going to take a risk, I try to think about what the, the, the cost-benefit analysis of that risk is. But I sometimes wonder if I you do. We'll get into that a yeah, little bit sometimes later, so okay? <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. Carmen Gentile is our guest. He's from New Kensington, uh, and his book is Blindsided by the Taliban. We'll talk more with him in just a moment. Stay tuned. Carmen 
Gentile is our guest. His book is called uh, Blinded by the Taliban, and in fact, he was hit by an RPG. Um, so you get home, you're, you've, you've had your medical treatment, and you start getting healed, uh, but you've got to go on this journey uh, to the, what did you call it, the cave of failure? <laughs> My failure cave. Your this fa is a failure cave. Place where I used but to you, live. Yeah. You, you come get this old motorcycle you used to have. Uh -huh in the snow and the rain from Washington, D.C., and just decided to head south to Florida. What was on your mind? Was it depression? Was it angst? Was it your failure? Your your fiancé had said goodbye, dear John, it, all it that? Was, it was all of that. Mm -hmm. It really was all of that. I had gotten to a point where I just needed to get away from uh, some... Some but a motorcycle feelings. with no right mirror and and no right eye, it's illegal to have the motorcycle with no mirror anyway, uh -huh. and you just cranked a rascal up uh -huh. and took off. Right, in the dead of winter, it was January of uh, 2011, snow on the ground, the bike had been parked outside for a number of months, it wouldn't start at first, and I was just begging this thing, please get just get started so Lucille. I can get out of here. Lucille. Lucille's actually parked outside in your parking lot right now. <laughs> you still riding? <laughs> yeah. A buddy of mine's been watching it while I'm... Uh, well, I live overseas, and uh, I just got her, got her back yesterday. Those German right bikes now. hold up. Huh? Oh, she holds up. Yeah, I can't <laughs> believe it. But she's yeah, she's 13 years old now. So, yeah, I uh, I just decided I had to go, and I had to try to feel normal again. I had tried to get. I was trying to. I think get my old life back. Um, I at one point I wasn't sure if I would ever even be able to drive a car because of my uh, monocular vision. And uh, so, I mean, probably not the smartest decision I've made. Definitely not the smartest, but uh, I decided to just get on the bike and go. But, but you know, beyond that, there have been a lot of decisions you've made, forgive me, that haven't been the smartest. The, the doctors told you, uh, don't do a lot of things. You, you're a surfer. They yeah. say, don't go, you go to Australia and go surfing. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, they say, don't dive. And you you get in the water and you dive. They yeah. talk about depression with right. you. What in the hell is wrong with you, man? At that time, I w had reached a point where I think I, I just didn't care. Um, it was, I understand this. I, believe it or not, I understand this. I, and, and I've been through it. Personally, and I've known guys who've been through it and, and situations as bad as you, who got Dear John letters, who came home, who weren't right. And, you know, we got 22 a day committing suicide right. now uh, because of these same factors that you were going through. And you were a civilian. Right. But you've been through the trauma of war and being wounded. Mm -hmm. um, all those things compounded. Uh, you know, the, one of the things about being over there um, and this is going to probably sound odd. Well, you, you might understand this. You, you said you were a Vietnam veteran. Your life is much simpler over there. For me, as a civilian, mm -hmm. when I'm embedded, I have three, res three things to worry about. I have to file stories, I have to eat, and I have to not get killed. Those are my only concerns. Everything else in your day-to-day -day, you can't do because you're there and so you can't address and there's there's these million different decisions you have to make a day when you're back here at home um, are no longer uh, part of your routine and so when you, you don't come even home, know what day it is sometimes. you don't even know what day it is mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter <laughs> so when you come home all those small decisions become compounded and they and they they weigh on you in ways that you you didn't you weren't expecting because you didn't know that they were actually that difficult um, and so you have that uh, to deal with and you also have to deal with maybe you're you, you're having a problem with your love life with your wife or your girlfriend or your family and it's it's it becomes uh, for some and I know it did for me, just it, it was too much. I knew a guy in Vietnam who came home, or as we say, go, went back to the world mm -hmm. and couldn't stand it and re up to come back to Absolutely. Vietnam because they could live in those conditions in a wartime, but they couldn't deal with the civilian life mm -hmm. here in America. As much as we wanted to come home, some of those guys came back and you. 
back here? What's on your mind? Right. Couldn't deal with it in the world, man. Yeah. And, and I think the same thing kind of happened to you. Tell me about the first time you went back to Afghanistan and what that was like. And everybody's telling you, what in the hell are you thinking and wagging fingers in your face? Well, I, I went back after I was cleared uh, by my doctors. I had. And this eight, is less than a year after being wounded, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was eight months. It was eight months after I had been injured. They cleared me. They said, you're, you're clear to resume your reporting. Um, we highly recommend you don't do that reporting in Afghanistan, but, you know, that's your choice. Uh, so I decided to go back. CBS didn't want me to go back, uh, but I'd also been working for USA Today. and They were the only ones that would hire they were the you only ones rate, that, that right? They thought this guy's, uh, you know, others probably thought that was a bad idea, but I, have a re I had a really good editor there who believed in me. And I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, "Okay, um, I, we think you're up to it. If you think you're up to it, let's let's make it happen." So I went back, and I can remember, and I this is uh, in the book. You know, the plane lands in Kabul, you know, in a civilian plane, uh, and I, a, a civilian flight, and it hits the tarmac, and I think, oh, man, this is a huge mistake. <laughs> I should not be doing this. I'm just sweating profusely, and I'm, and, I, and uh, my fists are clenched like this, and I'm, th and I'm, I thought, okay, maybe if I just turn around and go back, I know this will be the end of my career. No one will ever hire me to come over here again, but that's okay. And uh, I just worked my way one step at a time. Got off the plane, got into a got into a taxi, went to the hotel where I always stay when I'm in Kabul, and it, it was difficult. Not the luxury one that's always no, a tech, right? not the luxury <laughs> one. I always choose the, yeah, I choose the one that nobody would, would bother wasting a single bullet firing on that place. That's one with a sleeping guard in the front. That's my hotel. I like that place. But I but that's what I that's what I did. I just I had to just take a breath and say, okay. You had to climb back on that horse, didn't you? I had to. You know, I couldn't. Uh, and I didn't want to let uh, my injury define the rest of my life. Now, I know it's going to be somewhere toward the top of my obituary someday, but I didn't want it to be the only thing uh, that, uh, you know, from that moment on that was going to be the defining moment of who I am. So I had to get past it somehow, and that was the only way I, I could think to, to do it. I tried um, doing it at home. Uh, with therapy and and talking to friends and maybe some other ways that weren't so productive, but I I just couldn't get past it, so I had to do it. Okay, uh, Blinded by the Taliban is the book. It's available now online. Yes, uh, Blindsided by the Taliban is available on Amazon. You can find it at Barnes and Noble and at a bookstore near you. Blindsided by the Taliban is the book. Carmen Gentile is our guest. We're going to continue our conversation with him in just a moment. I hope you'll stay tuned. Stay cool when you're feeling hot, but running your air conditioner all day costs a lot. Fastener all day costs a lot. Fast Carmen G. Till is the war correspondent, and he is our guest. We're talking about his experiences. So you go back to Afghanistan uh, within a year injured. You say you landed, but you finally get to call to embed with another unit. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that like when you get anywhere near combat? And describe that Celine Dion moment for us, please. <laughs> I hope I'm not telling too much. No, that's okay. okay. We can have right. That's a funny one. Mm -hmm. um, it, well, it wasn't funny at the time. No, I can, it wasn't I funny I can just time. imagine what right. you were going through. Right, Go right. So uh, I was placed with a unit in southern Afghanistan uh, in Kandahar where there had been a lot of fighting. And um, the first time that we, uh, I'm positioned to go out with them on a foot patrol, and the uh, first sergeant is telling me, okay, this is what you need to do in case you're injured. A, a lecture I'd heard a thousand times but this time I'm really listening to it and it in addition to it being a hundred plus degrees and I'm wearing all this body armor I'm just my my boots are filling with sweat I'm so nervous to, to walk with these guys because we're walking on footpaths that um, another uh, US soldier had uh, stepped on an IED in that same area fortunately wasn't hurt but was blown off his feet 
and we're walking in that same area, and I'm thinking, oh. the whole thing didn't go off, right? No, no, mm -hmm. but he, it, you know, but it, you know, he was 20 years old, so he mm -hmm. bounced right up, of course. Um, but we're walking these same paths, and uh, I was nervous as can be, obviously. And at one point, then we we meet up with a group of uh, Afghans who are talking to us. Telling us about you know what the Taliban activity is in the area. I'm sorry for giggling, but I, <laughs> no. I giggled when I read it. Yeah. To tell you the truth. So one of them comes up to us and he's got this device that's like a smoke detector with all these wires hanging out of it. And I'm thinking this guy's gonna blow us all up, you know. Suicide uh, bomber. As a right? suicide bomber, but he's instead of a belt, he's just you know he's holding it and here we're all gonna be gone. And so what he's really what he he uh, it turned the device turned out to be was a homemade MP3 with a little chip in it and the wires that he had made himself with a speaker. Uh, all housed in this what looked like I said looked like a smoke detector you'd find on your ceiling and he's playing for us the, the Celine Dion song my heart will go on <laughs> for some reason <laughs> Afghans love that they love Celine Dion I've heard it plenty of times I've heard she's a big hit over yeah she's she's they you know they wear their hearts on their sleeves like anyone else I guess but mm. yeah I was hard in my throat and then laughing at the same time <laughs> with that but that's moment. the kind of experience war is uh, oh yeah a, a, a turf uh, a lot of dullness and, mm -hmm. and loneliness uh, punctured by moments of sheer terror. Isn't that is it? that is the uh, the common experience across uh, many a war. Yeah, you have these long bouts of boredom punctuated with moments of sheer terror, mm -hmm. uh, and you do get a lot of that in Afghanistan. Um, but it's it's during some of those down moments that you get to know the the soldiers um, and. Even in those moments of sheer terror, there are times when I have been with guys who are, are cracking jokes. There are bullets whizzing around, and they're cracking jokes. And that's how they cope. And um, I've always had a penchant for that kind of dark humor. Uh, I lost it a little bit as after I got hurt. You know, I was so self-involved and trying to to put my life back together but I had learned during the course of my uh, time that I when I had gone back how to how to get some of that that humor back and it's it's so important to them to be able to um, laugh in the face of adversity. You have to laugh in the face of adversity and that's something that... And that's that, more than adversity. Somebody's yeah, trying to kill you. Someone's trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. I mean, they take their job seriously. They're, they're, you know, trying to keep one another safe, but at the same time they have to be, maintain some semblance of humor. Well, what do you make of this whole war effort and happening to the, the citizens of these countries, uh, be it Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, anywhere that we have... I call it going around the world stomping mud holes in people's chests. And I, I think it gives America a bad name, to tell you the truth. But you've been there. I wonder what you think. Um, in a place like Afghanistan, the current population there has endured decades and now generations of war, strife. Well, I'm about to say centuries. You know what they did to the yeah. British? Yes, yes. In the 1920s? I'm just, I'm just going back as, as far back as Alexander, the, it yeah, goes to Alexander goes the Great. You right. know that. Yeah. You wrote about it. Yeah, but I'm he was I, the last one with any sense to get out of there. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, um, the the last one, the last uh, uh, army to make a dent in Afghanistan was uh, Genghis Khan in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just going back through recent history, back to the Soviet invasion, there's this, like I said, decades of of this continuing fighting that has, uh, I would say, in a way, warped an entire or generation or two uh, of people. Uh, and um, there's still a lot of great people there. I know I have great friends in Afghanistan. Uh, Is it a war you think that we can win given the political climate too? No, not at all. The uh, same thing about Vietnam. It's something. the same thing about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, there's. I was talking to someone the other day, and they made a really good point about it. We've been there for 17 years, mm -hmm. but actually, we actually, it's 17 one-year wars, if you think about it, because every time there's a new uh, unit comes in from a deployment, they're basically starting all over again in a different place, getting to know the local leaders. Re-establishing, uh, you know, connecting with these with their Afghan partners, Talk to and the you're starting elders. and you're starting mm -hmm. all over again. And now, with the the U.S. has, has dramatically uh, redeployed, uh, you know, we only have about eleven thousand troops there now, um, from the height of a hundred thousand plus. 
uh, the gains that had been made and and that were temporary then uh, they're all they're all lost all right we're going to have to take a break we'll come back with our final segment uh, with our guest i hope you'll stay right where you are Till is our guest. His book is Blindsided by the Taliban. It's available in better bookstores where they still exist and online. Um, so you return to Afghanistan at least three times and you finally go back to the base where you were shot. What mm -hmm. was that like? Um, I went back there hoping to somehow close the loop on my uh, experience. Um, it doesn't really work that way. It only works like that in, in the, and, and in the movies. And it was tough watching the video you were shooting right. at the time you got right. shot it, because you could still hear all the audio on it right. and everything. Right. right. So mm -hmm. I, I, I went back there thinking maybe this will finally put a pin in that. I'll be able to move past everything. Um, you know, I, I had this picture perfect idea that, that this would bookend my my uh, experience. Of course, it doesn't work out. Life doesn't work like that mm -hmm. way. It only works like that in the movies. Um, so I go there and I'm immediately scared out of my mind because they, we have to land late at night. And, they and they're say, saying, just get off, get off and run. Because we, we barely go touch <laughs> yeah, down. Yeah, we're going right? to touch down and you got to run. And, you know, I, I knew this base, but it was, it was, it was pitch black and they certainly don't have any lights on. And so I'm running with all my gear, you know, ass over ankles and trying to, to get over to the, to, to the cover. And uh, I'm just thinking to myself, again, what, what the hell are you doing <laughs> being here? And uh, I get there and I link up with a whole new group of guys. The situation is in that area has somehow become worse. They're not even going into the places where we had gone, I'd gone with the previous unit. Um, in fact, they, and the captain knew, knew you were coming. He knew what had happened he, to you before. He knew what had happened to me before, and it was funny enough. They were asking me questions about what's it like up on that hill over there. I was like, <laughs> I, I got video if you want to look at it. You know, I could tell you. I could, what, I could would, tell you. We only have 30 seconds left. Right. The time really flies. What would right. you leave us with with your experience? You know, my my book is not a book about war per se. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a book about Afghanistan and policy. It's about um, hurt and overcoming it physical and emotional uh, and trying to have a sense of humor about it even in the darkest of times you got to find a way to laugh you've got to find a way to put one foot in front of the other um, and find your inspiration wherever you can and um, well Carmen yeah. when you landed back there they started shooting again and the captain said they know you're back. Yeah, right? they did. And okay. it, it, that made me laugh. All right. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks for I'm having Chris me. Moore, back with one more thought in just a second.